Okay, so next up is uh, Rafi Selikovsky. Did I say that right? Perfect. Welcome, Rafi from Tableau Software. Hi. <laughs> So Rafi is the Senior Manager for Product Consulting at Tableau Software. She spends her days helping customers see and understand their data. Mm -hmm. And she leads a team of over 30 data rock stars. Awesome. Yes. So today you will tell us about storytelling techniques and how to tell a convincing story with data. So That's take it, it away. Thank you. There you go. Okay, great. Good afternoon, ladies, and my colleague Peter, who's in the back taking pictures. Um, say hello to him. He's a little shy. <laughs> so I actually think that the last talk was a perfect segue into what I'm going to speak about today, uh, which is how to tell good stories with data. And a lot of it is actually about communication. So the TED talk that we saw was a perfect segue. Let me not drop this. All right, so um, if you had asked me five years ago if I was going to be speaking at the Nordic Women in Data event, I would have definitely not believed you for two reasons. Um, the first is that I'm not even close to being Nordic at all. Uh, as you can tell from my name, um, which is kind of Eastern European, and my accent, which is American, uh, I'm definitely not Nordic. Um, but I thought I would try to maybe make it a little bit more comfortable for you. So if you want, feel free to uh, change my name just to end uh, here in Sweden to fit in, or if there's anyone uh, Danish in the audience, then you can feel free to spell it like that as well. <laughs> now, the second reason why I would have never believed you is that uh, actually six, five or six years ago, um, I was finishing up my dissertation at the London School of Economics, um, and I did not study data or computer science or anything related to what I do now, um, I was actually studying global politics, which is a super useful degree for what I'm doing today. And um, back then, I, as I said, I didn't have anything to do with data, so I'd never heard of SQL. I didn't know the difference between a left join and an inner join. Um, I thought that the cloud was what I used to connect to Wi-Fi. And uh, this was my idea of big data. This is actually a table that came from my dissertation. Uh, my dissertation was about um, the economics of developing countries and uh, trade agreements. So back then I was looking for a job, and as I said, it was a very useful degree. Um, but I was ready to kind of step out of what I had studied. And um, I met a girl called Bethany, who worked at a company called Tableau, which is a data science and analytics company. And Bethany uh, invited me to come to the Tableau office. And she showed me around. It was a beautiful office based in central London, um, just behind the Tate Modern. Um, she introduced me to some of the people that worked there. So it was a super diverse team, uh, men and women from all around Europe and the US. Um, Bethany's actually Canadian. She showed me the kitchen, which is uh, <laughs> How I now refer, now I know is referred to affectionately as the Tableau 10 kilos for the weight that you gain. Um, this used to be an oversized blazer before I started working at Tableau. <laughs> and she also gave me a demo of the product. And I had never seen anything like it. Um, I had never, I guess, understood data in that way. And I never thought that someone with my background or experience could understand or visualize data um, the way that she showed me with Tableau. Now, consider the alternative. Bethany could have sent me the job description for the role that she wanted me to apply for, which was for a product consultant. And all of those same facts and figures, everything that she told me about the company and the role, could have been included in that. It could have said, oh, you know, we have 60 people based in Europe. Everyone's from a different country. Uh, this is what you're going to be doing. You're going to be doing product demonstrations. You're going to be talking to customers. You're working in pre-sales. If I had read that job description, I would have never applied for the job. And my life today would be completely different. So what Bethany managed to do was, in half an hour, have me completely bought into the idea of what my life would look like working at that company, and how Tableau, or how working at Tableau, would add value. So this relates to 
why we're here today. Um, because Bethany, essentially what she did was build a story around the role, and she translated facts and figures into something that I could understand. Um, it's kind of what we saw in the last talk. Uh, today, you know, five years later, the terms like big data and Internet of Things are so ubiquitous that even lowly political science majors like myself understand them. So it is important for us as data practitioners, which all of us in the room are, to understand how we communicate the insights that we gain from our data. And that's all about kind of finding, uh, finding a way to combine uh, what we understand of from data and how other people are going to understand it or get communication from it. And the reason that this is important and why hopefully you find it interesting um, is that if we are not able to properly communicate insights from our data, um, then we're never going to have any impact or change. Hopefully you want impact or change. I know now not to pull the audience on anything, so I'm going to make everything rhetorical questions. <laughs> So, um, I feel very lucky to work at an organization whose mission it is to help people see and understand their data. And I think that there's two very key terms there, right? Seeing and understanding. And again, it's bringing together uh, the visual and the comprehension. So how can we make um, our side of the brain that takes in information uh, also understand why something is important? The next element that you should think about when you're telling your data story is what your objective is. So if you think about it, there's three different things that you can uh, use data for when it comes to storytelling. You could use it to explain, enlighten, or engage. And all of these things have something in common, which is that we're using data storytelling in order to persuade. We're trying to convince someone of something that we believe to be true or something that we find in data to be true. Um, in the past, what we have seen across multiple disciplines is that people are actually persuaded more by the story around facts and figures than the facts and figures themselves. So it's really important to learn how do we package the information um, that we gain from data to actually persuade another person or group of people. So in today's session, I'm going to break this down into what I think are the three main components for building a successful data story. Uh, the first, which is the title of the session and what we've already kind of talked about, uh, is to keep it simple. And this is all about making sure that the message that you're trying to communicate is clear to your audience. The second is to use compelling visuals. This sounds a bit obvious, um, but it's really important to try and engage uh, your viewers or, or the audience intended for your data story um, so that they actually want to be engaged. And the last element is to give context. So let someone know what's important for them to take away. Don't just assume that by giving them your data story or, or your visualization that they're going to understand what your goal is for them to take away. Finally, what I want to emphasize is that a great data story is just like any other story. So if you can remember uh, doing this in primary school when you have to have create your first story, um, you need all of these elements to it. So uh, the first element that you need are your characters. And um, this can relate to business as well. So you can think of your characters as your stakeholders or your users or your customers. Next, you need a challenge. So uh, what is the question that you're trying to ask of your data? What are you trying to understand? Um, maybe, you know, why do we have more traffic from mobile phones versus uh, our email campaigns, things like that. The third is there has to be an insider resolution. So uh, what does the data actually show us? How do we overcome uh, the challenge that we've set out for ourselves? And finally, this all has to come together in a story arc. So how do we tell our story to kind of build up um, towards the challenge and eventually get to the insight or resolution? So I want to give three examples of what I think use the uh, kind of three elements that I talked about before uh, in the context of how they've built a data story. The first example is a very old visualization. Um, I won't ask you to raise hands. I'm going to guess about 50% of you have seen this before, and 50% haven't. Uh, so this is a visualization made by Charles Minard, and the purpose of it was to uh, understand 
uh, what happened during uh, an invasion of Russia by Napoleon's troops. Uh, this is during the Napoleonic War, so about 1812, actually says it on there, 1812 to 1813. And I think it's a really great visualization that gives us an example of how to keep it simple. So in this visualization, uh, the characters, in terms of this story, are Napoleon's troops. Um, so if we start on this side of the visualization, um, this is kind of the beginning of our story. So the big, uh, thick orange line is where Napoleon's troops started in Poland in 1812. Um, and a few months, they make their way to Russia, and this is kind of where Napoleon's troops end up in Moscow. And this is where we sort of get a first insight into our challenge, because as you can see, by the time the troops get to Moscow, that orange line is much thinner than when it started. So this is Charles Menard explaining to us how a loss of life occurred along that journey, along a timeline. And this is because uh, the troops were getting attacked by Russian soldiers all along their supply line. And by the time they got to Moscow, there was actually no army left to fight there. So in the middle of winter, they had to turn around and go all the way back. And this is the black line that we see returning. So actually, the insider resolution to this story is the kind of tiny black line at the bottom of the screen, which shows what was left of that army when they came back to where they started. And in terms of the storytelling arc here, uh, what we can see is that Charles Menard uses a very simple and engaging visualization, which is just a single line, to communi communicate to us a number of factors. So he's telling us information like uh, the temperature, the time of year, the position and size of the army. And through all of this, we have a really quick way to understand and engage with what happened during that time. The second example is using compelling visuals. Um, hopefully, most of you have seen this before. There's no volume on it. Um, but it's a very quick video that was made uh, by the late Hans Rosling. Um, and if you haven't seen it, I'll try. I can't be as engaging as him when he narrates this. Um, but essentially, what he's doing is telling us uh, how he kind of built this visualization. So, um, on one axis, he has lifespan, another axis, income. And what he's about to do, and I won't try and talk over him, um, is add in all of the countries of the world where they start in this position, and then eventually narrate uh, how they develop over time. So, I'll just let this run so that you're not too distracted. You should definitely watch this with the audio if you've never seen it before. So the characters in this case, in this story, are the countries of the world, right? And the challenge is how are they developing over time, right? So how are they uh, going from kind of short lifespans, low income, to the upper right-hand side of the chart? Eventually, as he goes through the years, the insight or resolution uh, when it comes to this visualization is that uh, developing countries start to catch up. But what I find uh, really interesting about this visualization is that the arc in this case is the passage of time, and that, I'll just, now he's just talking, so I'll just stop that and go back. <laughs> um, what I find really interesting is that I see nowadays a lot of data visualization where animation is just used as a gimmick. It's a way to get attention from your users, but it's not adding any additional value. And I think Hans Rosling's um, animation in this case is an excellent way to tell a data story because the animation is actually adding an additional element. You're able to see not just, OK, from 1810 to 2018, what happened to this country, you're actually seeing all of the steps in between. Um, so there's a great point in the video where he reaches World War I or World War II, and you see all the countries drop in the graph. And that's a really impactful way to tell a data story um, using animation. The third example I had was about adding context. Um, and this is a set of visualizations that are about a uh, space jump. Um, from someone called Felix Baumgartner. Does anyone remember this one? I'll pull you guys. Yes? No? Okay. Yeah, actually. So um, in 2012, uh, there was an Austrian man, Felix Baumgartner, who wanted to break the record for uh, the highest space jump, so jumping out of a plane. Um, and after the space jump, there was only really three data points that we could use to tell this story. There was how uh, high he fell from, how fast he went, and how long it took. 
But in this great visualization, what the author has done is take on additional data to start to contextualize what that actually meant. So if I were to tell you that Felix jumped 128,000 feet, that's really hard to conceptualize on its own. It's really hard to understand the impact of that. But when we compare that to other heights that we do know, you can see that um, the Burj Khalifa is like this small compared to his jump, which is that high. And that starts to let us know, you know actually how much that distance is. And it's actually 100,000 feet higher than where commercial airliners usually fly. And that means something a lot more than the number on its own. Next, we saw how fast he was going. So he went 834 miles per hour. And the author did something really simple here. Besides giving other points of reference, they actually put a reference line with the speed of sound. So we're comparing someone's distance as they travel to Earth with the speed of sound. Finally, how long it took. Um, and this one is my favorite because you see that he has a whole seven seconds of silence after listening to the entire song Free Falling by Tom Petty. It's a long time. My final reminder when you're creating a data story is that this is not a linear process. So when you're going back to your companies or your organizations and you're thinking about how can I make a data story, you need to involve other people in this process. It's not static. You don't take you know, your data or your visualization and say, this is my story, and share it. Um, this needs to be a process where you engage other people, um, gain more information, gain more understanding of how uh, your visualization or your data story is perceived, and then you're iterating on it. You're creating new versions of it, and you're improving it. So I want to talk a little bit about how you can use what we've learned with data storytelling to actually do something. And this is all about um, what I mentioned in terms of having an objective that you want uh, to gain with your data story. So the first example um, is going to be about uh, gaining external buy-in. So this is basically about um, having kind of something to prove or having an objective or hypothesis that you're using data storytelling for. Um, I realized today that my examples are really dark in terms of the <laughs> visualizations I chose, so I'm sorry about that. Um, but I'm going to start with this one, uh, which is a statement that says the war in Iraq was a bloody conflict. And this is a visualization uh, that actually is an award-winning wi award visualization that was in the South China Morning Post that is basically backing up this claim. And it's a great visualization. It's a great data story. It's simple, right? All we have is basically an inverse bar chart as the main visualization on the page. It uses compelling visuals. So right away, we see that color red, and we start to associate it with the point of the visualization or the data story. And they give us context. So the title tells us exactly what we're supposed to infer from the data. But let's take this same exact data, this same visualization, and think about how we can actually change our objective. If I just take this main visualization and flipped it around, we already see something different from the data. Right? We see this huge peak where we had a big loss of life, and then we already see it start to decline. If we change the coloring on this, again, the impact of the visualization is completely different. And finally, if I just change that title, we now see that the objective that the author has in terms of telling their data story has a huge impact on what we as the audience perceive or understand. Because I could take, and I'll put them side by side, I could take that same exact visualization, the same data, turn it around, change the color, and we're now telling a completely different data story. So this is really you know, your uh, ownership, basically, or the onus is on you as the data storyteller um, to, to give the audience an understanding of what they're supposed to take away. Another way that we do this is internally within our or own organizations. And this isn't very different from when you're using it externally. But the main point I'll make about this is that you need to make this personal. When it's about having to convince someone something that has to do with you, um, then you cannot remove yourself from the data story. So 
I'm going to give an example of something that is uh, slightly personal. So as I said, I'm American, and most of my family still lives in the US, so I live in London now. Um, and my sister just had a baby, and we're always arguing uh, whether she should move to Europe eventually. <laughs> and so I wanted to uh, convince her, or tell her, show her a data story um, about childcare being more expensive in the US than it is in Europe. So now's the risky part where I go and actually try and do this live, so we'll see how all the technology cooperates. Okay. Let me just see. Great. So I did a presentation a couple months ago, and I hadn't signed in in advance. And then I said my password out loud while I was typing it in. So this time I made sure I signed in in advance. Um, great. So, oh no, you can't see that at all. Do you know how to duplicate the display? It's obviously because the keyboard is in Swedish. I could have done it myself. Um, great. So uh, I'm just going to build a quick data story uh, that has to do with uh, some data that has uh, different countries and factors that we know about in terms of childcare. So um, I'm going to kind of do this in the structure that we talked about before. So the first thing that I want to see is who our characters are in this story. And in this case, uh, it's the different countries that are in the data set. So I'll just bring out my different countries here and make it a bit easier for you to see. And also find out how many weeks of statutory paid maternity leave each of these countries have. And again, I want to keep this visualization very simple um, so that it's easy to understand. And now it's already easy to make my point to my sister, right? The US has zero weeks of paid maternity leave. Um, quite sad, actually. Um, and Finland, if anyone's from Finland, yeah, you guys are the best, 161 weeks, that's amazing. So, so far so good, I can uh, start to tell my data story. Uh, the next thing that we wanted to do, uh, besides look at our characters, is uh, understand what the um, objective is, right? Or sorry, what's the challenge? So in this case, the challenge as it was set up is uh, kind of a comparison between uh, Europe and the US regionally. So to do this, um, I'm just going to place this on a map. And a map is a great way to tell a data story because it's already taking advantage um, of how we perceive information. When you see a map, um, it's a familiar visual element, so it's easier to understand. Um, so here's a map of all my countries. And um, this time, I'm just going to put on my uh, percent spend of family income. So um, as soon as I do that, we can see for each country um, how much they spend. So in the US, it's 25% of our income is spent on childcare. But if I want to compare these, I might um, group up some of our Nordic countries, because as we know, um, you guys just have really good healthcare policies, uh, or childcare policies, sorry. So um, I'll just go ahead and group these countries up. And now we have the Nordics, so we have the US, and Europe. So now what I can do is then see how these different kind of blocks compare. Um, and we see that Europe, it's about 15% of your income is spent uh, on childcare, the US 25%, and the Nordics only 10%. So um, this is kind of turning into like why my sister should move to the Nordics instead of Europe, um, <laughs> which uh, I'm not, not necessarily is a bad thing, but um, I, I might want to then break this down by country just so I have a more specific aim. And this is kind of the last part of the data story, which is the insider resolution. Um, so for starting out on the basis that everyone has 100% income, I want to compare what we learned uh, in the last visualization against all the individual countries. So I'll bring in my uh, percent family income and uh, maybe just also show uh, that percentage so it's easier to see. So we start at 1%. And if I just go ahead and overlap these, I become a bit of a perfectionist when it comes to this stuff. So sorry, but I'll try and do it quickly. Oops. And then I zoomed out for some reason. 
Okay. Great. <laughs> cool. Um, and if I just sort this, so let's just see this in highest to lowest. Um, what I learned, which is not good for me, is that the UK is actually uh, the highest when it comes to the percent of your family income that's spent on childcare. Um, so I have come to an interesting conclusion in my data story. Um, I might not necessarily share the whole thing with my sister, but, <laughs> but if I were going to, a great way to do this is to kind of bring together your data story and the journey um, that you made so that your end user can walk through it. So, oh, I keep doing that zoom. Okay, now it's gigantic. So um, I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to use something in Tableau that we use called storytelling, which makes this really easy. Um, and the first thing I'm going to do is kind of walk through where I started, which was with um, those different characters. So um, I'll just double click here, and I can already see uh, my chart that I saw earlier on the countries and the number of weeks of paid maternity. And I can say something like, you know, the US has no paid maternity. Ooh. And then bring in uh, my map. as a new point and say something like, uh, Europe is awesome. And then finally bring in my percent family income and I might even highlight you know, the US and maybe change my data story to say something like, okay, the US isn't the worst. I'll come visit. <laughs> so you don't have to uh, overcomplicate things basically when you're creating your data story. All it takes um, are the elements that we've talked about in terms of keeping it simple, thinking about how you structure your data story, um, using visualizations that people are going to understand. Um, so you might be curious at this point, and hopefully I'll be able to go back to this. Great, no man necessary. Okay, so you might be curious at this point, uh, how did my story end? Obviously, I work at Tableau, um, but when I left the office um, that fateful day six years ago or five years ago and spoke with Bethany, uh, the next thing I did was actually downloaded Tableau and this is what I made. It's the very first data visualization that I ever made. Um, and nowadays I look at this and I think it's horrendous, but back then I used it as a way to communicate uh, my own value and my own data story. And it was it's actually what I submitted for my application to the job. Um, and for me, it was my way to say, okay, this isn't my background, this isn't what I, um, you know, might traditionally, what you might traditionally find in a candidate, um, but I'm passionate and I can learn, and this is what I can produce with very little skills, <laughs> natural skills. Um, fast forward five years later, so at that point I joined a team of six product consultants, um, and as Linda mentioned, I now manage a team of 34 product consultants, um, and I'm happy to say that we are 21 women and 13 men on my team, um, so I'm happy to talk about that at another point, because she's already standing on the side, so I'm at, whoa, I'm way out of time. Um, yeah, I'm happy to talk about that, but I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's really important and it hasn't been that hard to find this balance on my team, so I'm happy to talk about that later. Um, and if you're wanting to get started, a lot of the visualizations I used come from um, Tableau Public, which is like our YouTube of data visualizations. It's free, so feel free to get started and use that if you're curious. Um, and you have two minutes for questions. <laughs> Thank you, Rafi. Thanks. So, yes. <laughs> So any questions from the audience for Rafi? You taught them everything you know. I scared them. So they're uh, good to go in, into the world to create visualizations. So no questions for Rafi? Okay, so uh, thanks a lot oh, we then. We have one question. Yeah, one okay. brave soul. <laughs> Very good question. So the question is that it's very easy to lie with data. So how do we make sure? I mean, you said when using Tableau, but I think with any product um, that we're not lying with data. Uh, that's a very good question. I think um, 
you know, I think part of that is actually education of your audience as well. Um, I think it's, it's our responsibility as data practitioners to not lie with data, but then it's also our responsibility to teach others what to expect and what to look for. Um, one example is uh, I made a visualization to show our speaker ratings for our last conference, um, and I took out uh, zero on the axis so that the difference between us and the next team looked a lot bigger uh, than it would otherwise, right? So I was changing the perspective to tell my data story. Um, but because I showed this to an audience of people who all use Tableau, they spotted it right away and then um, laughed at me because they were like, well, you don't really have any point here. So um, I think, yeah, the responsibility is with us as as data practitioners and data storytellings, and also um, as educators for, for those that are going to be consuming our, our data stories. One more question. So the microphone is coming. Yes, it looks really nice, Tableau. I, I haven't used it, but um, is there some situation or kind of data where you wouldn't recommend, recommend to use Tableau? It's perfect for everything. Okay, so we're <laughs> exiting the data storytelling realm. <laughs> um, okay, so the question is, when would I not use Tableau? Um, help me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, could you give a background to that question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's more like um, uh, some products are good for some kind of uh, clients, other not. Uh, uh, of course, Tableau looks good. I haven't just it, uh, but maybe sometimes I say, okay, maybe it's no um, kind of fit for this kind of problem or the kind of analytics, but maybe it's perfect for everything. Like you, you can answer that, no problem. <laughs> well, so <laughs> I'll give the answer, which is that what Tableau is designed for is for every industry, so it's not specifically for a given vertical or a uh, line of business. It's meant to be, um, yeah, for any kind of business or organization. Um, yeah. Yeah, just... Um yeah, build on to that so very broad and deep. So it doesn't matter which platform, Mac, Windows, Linux, it, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what database you have. So as Rafi said, design for any use case you might, might have. We can take that um, in the break, maybe, in the cafeteria, so we don't do the yeah, sort of sales pitch here on stage. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thank you okay, so much, Rafi. Okay, thank you.